Hey everyone, welcome to Advanced Exercise Physiology. Today we'll be covering Chapter 8, Skeletal Muscle and its Structure and Function. The objectives of Chapter 8 are 1. To draw and label the microstructure of skeletal muscle. 2. To define satellite cells. To answer the question, how do these cells differ from the nuclei located within the skeletal muscle fibers? 3. To list the chain of events that occur during muscular contraction. 4. To define both dynamic and static exercise. And to answer the question, what types of muscle action occur during each form of the exercise? 5. To describe the three factors that determine the amount of force produced during muscular contraction. 6. To list the three main human skeletal muscle fiber types and to compare and contrast the major biochemical and mechanical properties of each. Seven, to describe how skeletal muscle fibers types influence athletic performance. And eight, to graph and describe the relationship between movement velocity and the amount of force exerted during muscular contraction. For those of you taking notes, here's an outline to help you during this process. Please notice the major topics listed in bold, including structure of skeletal muscle, neuromuscular junction, muscular contraction, exercise and muscle fatigue, exercise associated muscle cramps, fiber types, muscle actions, speed of muscle action and relaxation, force reg regulation and muscle, and force velocity slash force power relationships. To begin, we'll discuss skeletal muscle. The human body contains over 400 skeletal muscles, comprising 40 to 50% of total body weight. If we look at the functions of skeletal muscle, we say they're involved in force production for locomotion and breathing, force production for postural support, and heat production during cold stress. There's two types of muscle actions, flexors, which decrease joint angles, and extensors, which increase joint angles. Now looking at the connective tissue that covers muscle cells, we see the epimesium, which surrounds the entire muscle, the paramesium, which surrounds the bundles of muscle fibers, we have the endomesium, which surrounds individual muscle fibers, we have a basement membrane just below the endomesium, in the sarcolemma, which is the muscle cell membrane. Here's a diagram of each of the connective tissues surrounding the skeletal muscles, which you can reference in your book. Now to move our discussion to satellite cells, they play a role in muscle growth and repair. And they do this by increasing the number of nuclei. Within this, there's a myonuclear domain, which involves a cytoplasm surrounding each nucleus. In addition, each nucleus can support a limited myonuclear domain. What we see is the more nuclei allow for a greater amount of protein synthesis, and this is extremely important for adaptations to strength training. Now, to discuss the microstructure of muscle fibers, what we see is myofibrils, which contain contractile proteins, both actin, the thin filament, in mouse in the thick filament. There are sacromeres, which includes a Z-line, an M-line, an H-zone, an A-band, and an I-band. We also see the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is a storage site for calcium, and terminal cisternae. Finally, there's transverse tubules, which extend from the sclerema to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Next, you'll see the diagram of the microstructure of a skeletal muscle and all the components just described. You can reference this diagram in your book. In addition, here is a more detailed view of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the transverse tubules. Next, to discuss the neuromuscular junction, we see that this is the junction between motor neuron and a muscle fiber. This can comprise a motor unit, which is the motor neuron and all the fibers it innervates. 
In the junction, we see a motor end plate, which is the pocket formed around the motor neuron by the sarcolemma. In addition, there's a neuromuscular cleft, which is a short gap between the neuron and the muscle fiber. What we see is acetylcholine is released from the motor neuron, which causes an end plate potential, which results in a depolarization of the muscle fiber. Here you will see a more detailed diagram of the neuromuscular junction and its components. Please reference your book for this diagram. In summary, the human body contains more than 600 voluntary skeletal muscles, which constitute 40 to 50 percent of the total body weight. Skeletal muscle performs three major functions. One, force production for locomotion and breathing. Two, force production for postural support. And three, heat production during cold stress. Individual muscle fibers are composed of hundreds of thread-like protein filaments called myofibrils. Myofibrils contain two major types of contractile protein. One is actin, part of the thin filaments, and two is myosin, the major component of thick filaments. Next, the region of the cytoplasm surrounding an individual's nucleus is termed the myonuclear domain. The importance of the myonuclear domain is that a single nucleus is responsible for the gene expression for its surrounding cytoplasm. Motor neurons extend outward from the spinal cord to innervate individual muscle fibers. The site where the motor neuron and the muscle cell meet is called the neuromuscular junction. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that stimulates the muscle fiber to depolarize, which is a signal to start the contractile process. Now we move on to the sliding filament model. This is also called the swinging lever arm model. What we see is muscle shortening occurs due to the movement of actin filament over the myosin filament. This happens with the formation of cross bridges between the actin and myosin filaments called the power stroke. In addition, we see a reduction in the distance between the Z lines of the sarcomere. In this diagram, we can show you the sarcomere shortening during the muscle contraction. Please reference this diagram in your book. Next, we see the relationship among topamin, tropomyosin, myosin, and calcium in the sliding filament theory. Next, we would like to discuss the energy that's needed for muscle contraction. As discussed previously, ATP is required for muscle contraction. Myosin ATPase breaks down ATP as fiber contracts. The ATP is broken down to ADP plus phosphorus. Again, we discussed the sources of ATP prior, where we have phosphocreatine, glycolysis, and oxidative phosphorylation. Again, this should be some review, but the diagram reviews and shows you the sources of ATP for muscle contraction. Again, please reference your book for this diagram. Next, I would like to go over excitation and contraction coupling. This is depolarization of the motor end plate due to excitation, and it is coupled with muscular contraction. What we see is an action potential travels down the transverse tubules that causes the release of calcium from the sacroplasmic reticulum. The calcium binds to troponin and causes a position change in tropomyosin. This is exposing active sites on actin. Next, there's a strong binding state formed between the actin and myosin, and contraction occurs. To go over the step-by-step -step summary of excitation-contraction coupling, we see that during excitation, first there is an axon potential in the motor neuron that causes the release of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. Two, we have acetylcholine that binds to receptors on the motor end plate. This leads to depolarization that is conducted down transverse tubules, which causes the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Next, looking at the contraction, first at rest, the myosin cross bridges in are, are in the weak binding state. Two, the calcium binds to troponin, causing a shift 
in the tropomyosin to uncover the active sites, and the cross bridge forms strong binding state. Three, the phosphorus is released from myosin and the cross bridge movement occurs. Next, ADP is released from the myosin. And five, ATP attaches to myosin, breaking the cross bridge and forming a weak binding state. Then, ATP binds to myosin, broken down to ADP plus phosphorus, which energizes myosin. This continues as long as calcium and ATP are present. In this diagram, you will see the muscle excitation, contraction, and relaxation. Please reference your book for details on this diagram. Next, we also see the steps leading to our muscular contraction. Please review the diagram again in your book. In summary, the process of muscular contraction can be best explained by the siding filament or swinging cross bridge model, which proposes that the muscle shortening occurs due to the movement of the actin filament over the myosin filament. Next, we see the steps leading to muscular contraction, which are, first, a nerve impulse travels down the transverse tubules, tubules and reaches the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the calcium is released. Next, the calcium binds to the protein troponin. Next, we see that calcium binding to troponin increases the position change in the tropomyosin away from the active sites on the actin molecule and binding between actin and myosin. Next, there's muscular contraction occurs by multiple cycles of cross bridge activity. Shortening will continue as long as energy is available, such as ATP, and calcium is free to bind to the troponin. When neuroactivity ceases at the neuromuscular junction, calcium is removed from the sarcoplasm and actively pumped in the sarcoplasmic reticulum by the calcium pump. This results in tropomyosin moving to cover the active site on actin and the muscle relaxes. Now moving on to muscle fatigue, we see this results in a decline in muscle power output. This would be defined as a decrease in force generation and a decrease in shortening velocity. Looking at high velocity exercise, approximately 60 seconds, what we see is an accumulation of lactate, hydrogen, ADP, and phosphorus, as well as free radicals, which diminish cross bridges bound to actin. For long duration exercises, approximately two to four hours, we see muscle factors such as the accumulation of free radicals, electrolyte imbalance, and glycogen depletion. This is a diagram of muscular fatigue, where what you see is a decrease in force production at the onset of fatigue as contraction time continues. In summary, muscle fatigue is defined as a reduction in muscle power output that results from decreased muscle force generation and shortening velocity. The causes of exercise-induced muscle fatigue are complex and vary depending on the type of exercise performed. Moving from fatigue to muscle cramps, we see a spasmodic involuntary muscle contraction as a cramp. This can be due to electrolyte depletion and dehydration theory. This is where water and sodium loss via sweating cause the spontaneous muscle contraction. There is also an altered neuromuscular control theory, where muscular fatigue causes abnormal activity in muscle spindle and the Golgi tendon organ. This leads to an increased firing of motor neurons, causing the cramp. In summary, muscle cramps are spasmodic and involuntary skeletal muscle contractions. The exact cause of the mu exercise-induced muscle cramp remains unclear. Nonetheless, mounting research indicates that many cases of exercise-associated muscle cramps occur due to abnormal spinal reflex activity that occurs as a byproduct of muscular fatigue. Now moving on and looking at the characteristics of muscle fiber types, we see biochemical properties 
One is the oxidative capacity, which is the number of capillaries, mitochondria, and the amount of myoglobin present. There's also the type of myosin ATPase, which is involved in the speed of ATP degradation. In addition to biochemical properties of muscle fiber types, there are contractile properties. These are involved in maximal force production, which is force per unit at cross-sectional area. We also see a property of speed of contraction, which is dependent on a myosin ATPase activity, and finally muscle fiber efficiency. If we ask the question, how are skeletal muscle fibers typed? we would discuss muscle biopsy, where a small piece of muscle is removed. This may or may not be representative of the entire body, however. In addition to a biopsy, we can do staining for type of the myosin ATPase. What is found is in type 1 fibers, they appear to be the darkest. Type 2A, the fibers are actually the lightest, and what we see in type 2X, fibers tend to be in between. In addition, we can look at immunohistochemical staining, where selective antibody binds to unique myosin proteins. Fiber types can then be differentiated based on a color difference. And finally, we can use gel electrophoresis, where we identify myosin isoforms specific to the different fiber types. Below you'll see an example of the immunohistochemical staining of skeletal muscle where for blue we have type 1 fibers, for green we see type 2A fibers, in the black there's type 2X fibers, and the red is dystrophin, which is a protein in the sarcolemma. Now that we've identified fiber types, we can look at the characteristics of each individual fiber. Type 1 fibers are also referred to as slow twitch fibers and are also slow oxidative fibers. Moving on to a type 2A fiber, we see that they're intermediate fibers and are classified as fast oxidative glycolytic fibers. Finally, type 2X fibers are fast switch fibers and are classified as fast, fast glycolytic fibers. Here you'll see a comparison of maximal shortening velocities between fiber types. you can see that type 1 fibers have the slowest velocity while type 2x are the fastest. Please reference your book for this diagram. Next you can also look at a comparison between force production and the power outputs between each fiber type. Again, type 2 has a smaller force and power production while type 2x has the highest. Finally, you can look at the characteristics of each muscle fiber type in Table 8.1 in your book. In summary, human skeletal muscle fiber types can be divided into three general classes of fibers based on their biochemical and contractile properties. Two categories of fast fibers exist, type 2X and type 2A, while there is only one type of slow fiber, which is type 1. The biochemical and contractile properties are characteristic of each muscle type and they are summarized again in Table 8.1. Continuing in our summary, although classifying skeletal muscle fibers into three general groups is a convenient system to study the properties of each muscle fiber, it is important to appreciate that human skeletal muscle fibers exhibit a wide range of contractile and biochemical properties. That is, the biochemical and contractile properties of type 2X, type 2A, and type 1 fibers represent a continuum instead of three neat packages. Now if we look at the fiber types in relation to performance, we see that non-athletes have approximately 50% slow and 50% fast fibers. If we look at power athletes, we see like a sprinter, which would have a higher percentage of fast fibers, while endurance athletes, classified as distance runners potentially, have a higher percentage of slow fibers.
Ultimately though, the fiber type is not the only variable that determines the success in an athletic event. In table 8.2, you can look at the distribution of fiber types in athletes like we just discussed. In summary, successful power athletes like sprinters generally possess a large percentage of fast muscle fibers and therefore a low percentage of slow type 1 fibers. In contrast to power athletes, endurance athletes like a marathoner typically possess a high percentage of slow muscle fibers and a low percentage of fast muscle fibers. Please remember, although muscle fiber types are known to play a role in sports performance, considerable variation exists among successful athletes competing in the same sport. Now looking at the types of muscle action, we see that one type is isometric, where the muscle exerts force without changing length. This involves pulling against an immovable object, or postural muscles. There's also dynamic, which would be called isotonic action as well. This can be concentric, where the muscle shortens during the force production, or eccentric, where the muscle produces force, but the length increases. This is associated with muscle fiber injury and soreness. In table 8.3, you can see a summary of the muscle actions. Here is an example of isometric, where the muscle is not lengthening, or isotonic, where the muscle is contracting. Now if we look at the speed of muscle action and relaxation, we see that in muscle twitch, contraction is the result of a single stimulus. The latent period is lasts approximately 5 milliseconds, where contraction, where tension is developed, takes place over approximately 40 milliseconds. And finally, we have relaxation, which occurs over 50 milliseconds. The speed of the shortening, however, what we see is greater in the fast twitch muscle fibers, where the sarcoplasmic reticulum releases calcium at a faster rate, and there's also a higher ATPase activity. This is a diagram representing the muscle twitch that we just discussed with the latent period, contraction, and relaxation in relation to time. Now if we move on to discuss force regulation in muscles, we see that there are types and a number of motor units recruited during force generation. What we can see is that the more units there are, that the greater the force that is produced. As well as the more fast motor units we have, we also see a greater amount of force produced. Part of this is contributed by the initial muscle length, where we see an ideal length that is, leads to force generation, which is the result of an increased number of cross bridge formation. Finally, looking at the nature of the neural stimulation of motor units, we see a frequency of stimulation that ranges from simple twitch to summation to tetanus. In the graph below, you'll see the relationship between stimulus strength and force contraction. At a certain point, you will reach a maximal response, and at which point the increasing stimulus strength will not produce a more amount of force in the contraction. In this diagram, we can look at the length tension relationship in the skeletal muscle again referencing an ideal amount of tension. Finally, we can look at the simple twitch, summation, and tetanus that were discussed in the nature of the muscle or the neural stimulation. Now looking at diseases and aging and how they can negatively impact muscle function we see that with aging, there is some muscle loss. This can be referred to as sarcopenia, where 10% of the muscle loss is between the ages of 25 and 50 years of age. An additional 40% is lost between the ages of 50 and 80. We also see a loss of fast twitch muscle fibers and a gain in slow twitch muscle fibers.
Fortunately, resistance training can delay age-related muscle loss. Looking more specifically at diabetes, we see that this is associated with a progressive loss of muscle mass. This can be combined with age-related loss. Fortunately, again, aerobic and resistance training are protective to this muscle loss. Now looking at cancer, we see that 50% of cancer patients suffer from cataxia, which is the rapid loss of muscle mass. This results in weakness and accounts for approximately 20% of death in cancer patients. Regular exercise and nutrition therapy may counteract this disease. Now looking at muscular dystrophy, we see that there's hereditary defects in a muscle protein. This results in a loss of muscle fibers and weakness. Within different types of muscular dystrophy, we see that Duchenne muscular dystrophy is the most common in childhood, where the progression varies based on the specific type of the disease. Moving on to the force versus velocity relationship, we see that at any absolute force, the speed of movement is greater in muscles with higher percentage of fast twitch fibers. The maximum velocity of shortening is the greatest at the lowest force. So this is true for both slow and fast twitch muscle fibers. In the graph below, you will be able to see the muscle force velocity relationship, where again, we have maximum force with the lowest velocity of movement in both fiber types. Continuing with the force power relationship, we see at any given velocity of movement, the power generated is greater in a muscle with a higher percentage of fast twitch muscle fibers. The peak power increases with velocity up to a movement speed of 200 to 300 degrees per second. Power decreases beyond this velocity because the force decreases with an increasing movement speed. This diagram again shows how the muscle force power relationship works. In summary, the amount of force generated during muscular contraction is dependent on the following factors. The types, of num the types and number of motor units recruited, the initial muscle length, and the nature of the motor unit's neural stimulation. The addition of muscle twitches is termed summation. When the frequency of the neural stimulation to motor unit is increased, individual contractions are fused in a sustained contraction called a tetanus. The peak force generated by muscle decreases as the speed of the movement increases. However, in general, the amount of power generated by a muscle group increases as a function of movement velocity. With the content from this chapter covered, I'd like to provide you with several study questions to help you learn and solidify the information. Number one, please list the principal function of skeletal muscles. Two. List the principal proteins contained in skeletal muscle. Three, outline the contractile process using a step-by-step -step format illustrating the entire process, beginning with the nerve impulse reaching the neuromuscular junction. Four, outline the mechanical and biochemical properties of the human skeletal muscle fiber types. 5. Discuss those factors thought to be responsible for regulating force during muscular contractions. 6. Define the term summation. 7. Graph a simple muscle twitch and the contraction that results in a tetanus. 8. Discuss the relationship between force and speed of movement during a muscular contraction. This concludes Chapter 8 where we looked at skeletal muscle and its structures and functions. Please reference the lecture or the text to familiarize yourself with the information and to answer any questions. In addition, feel free to email me at any point to clear up any confusion. Thanks.